I believe it's time for us to begin. We're going to have our last lesson today in a series on the topic of a biblical view of sin. Sin is opposed. What is sin opposed to? Sin is opposed to all good in general. Sin is the source of all other evils. There is a kind of infiniteness in sin. The evil of sin is seen in its conformity with the devil. Those will be the headings that we will consider this morning. First of all, sin is opposed to all good in general. Genesis 3.17 Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Sad words, tragic words. John Calvin comments, Before the fall, the state of the world was a most fair and delightful mirror of the divine favor and paternal indulgence towards man. Then he adds these words, Now, in all the elements, we perceive that we are cursed. What brought that about? Sin. Sin. Concerning creation, we read, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was the sin of Adam that brought a curse upon that world. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just, through one, just as through one man, sin entered the world. And death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Because all sin. Sin's entrance into the world brought God's judgment. So as a result, we see the truth of Calvin's observation. Now in all the elements we perceive that we are cursed. Think about this. Is it not a exercise in futility for man to seek genuine happiness and fulfillment in that which has been cursed? What, what a futile thing. Trying to find joy, happiness, satisfaction, all of these things, even peace of mind. But seeking them in a world and in things that have been cursed. Titus 1.15 To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. The effect of sin. Sin spoils everything for the unbeliever. Misery, pain, suffering, sorrow, 
heartache, disappointment, frustration has its roots in sin. The sinner, because of his own sin, is the source of his own sorrow. That is, he carries within him the potential to destroy everything that is good. Let me illustrate that in three aspects. Number one is the misuse and abuse of one's own natural abilities. We're going to consider these. These are three headings. And the first heading is this. The misuse and abuse of one's own natural abilities. Secondly, the misuse and abuse of acquired abilities. And thirdly, the deterioration of personal relationships. Let's look at them. First of all, the misuse and abuse of one's own natural abilities. Those who are described as being dead in trespasses and sin in Ephesians are also described as those who live to fulfill the lust of the flesh and of the mind. There's a connection between being dead in trespasses and sin and the kind of life that one is living. A life of fulfilling what? The lusts of the flesh. The use and abuse of the flesh in a sinful lifestyle. The lust of the flesh and of the mind are indulged in by the use of the various faculties which human beings possess. What about the mind? What about the use, misuse and abuse of the mind? Think of how the mind can dwell on unclean and impure thoughts. It has the ability to do that. As it were to put a slideshow going on in your mind. Now let me just put a little parenthesis here. That's why we need to guard against what we see as much as we can. Because once you see it, you can never unsee it. Totally. Satan has the ability to bring that back into your mind <coughs> 10 years from now. And make it a source of temptation. The mind. How about the eyes? We're, we've already mentioned it. <clears throat> that look upon those things which motivates wrong thoughts and desires. What about the feet? The feet can take you to places you should never go. How did you get there? Well, part of the way you got there was by your feet. God equipped us with feet. They can be used, misused and abused. What about the hands? The misuse and abuse of the hands. To touch that which is not allowed. To pick up and take those things which belong to someone else. What about the member of the tongue? Read James. James talks a lot about how the tongue can be misused and abused. To speak lies. To say words that are deceitful. Words that are hurtful. Words that are vulgar. David was guilty of misuse and abuse of his body in committing sin. He looked upon a woman. His eyes saw. It was the entrance of lust and desire. His lips were used to order the command to have Uriah murdered. Those very lips 
spoke the words that resulted in murder. His mind put together that clever little plan of how that murder would be carried out. He thought it up. You see, what we're saying is all of the things that have the quality of being good was used wrongly. Did that bring misery to David? He thought Bathsheba would be, bring happiness. He thought getting rid of Uriah would, would pave the way clear to have joy and happiness. Did he? Listen to his words. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. You see, every unredeemed sinner carries with him the capacity to destroy good. James describes it in these words, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is accomplished, brings forth joy and happiness and gladness. Death. Second heading, the misuse and abuse of acquired abilities. I remember Dr. Bob Jones Sr. when I was going to Bob Jones. He was still very much alive and spoke regularly in chapel. And he said, um, take an uneducated man and he'll steal a watermelon off the train. He said, educate him and he'll steal the train. The use, the abuse, misuse of acquired abilities. You cannot arrest a man for forging a check until you teach him how to write. You can't arrest a man for embezzlement until he learns the skill of accounting and abuses that skill. Pornographic literature cannot be read until one knows how to read. Sin can take that which has the potential for much good and cause it to be used to bring about <laughs> much evil and subsequently sorrow. Then the third topic is the deterioration of personal relationships. And I can tell you that in the years I've been in the ministry, I have seen, witnessed, talked to, dealt with situations that are heartbreaking. Even up until this present day, I find myself involved with those who are experiencing deep grief and sorrow because those relationships have been destroyed. And there's heartache. Think of the potential good that exists in the personal relationships that are part of life. Think of the great joy that can be experienced between parents and their children. In fact, Robert, I don't know if would probably wasn't aware that I may have said this, but I, we had a large youth group and I had uh, young married couples working with me to help with the youth group. And they would come, can I help 
uh, you work with these young people? And when, one thing I would tell them, I said, young people, young people can bring some of the greatest joy in your life. And I said, they can bring some of the greatest heartache ever in your life. And I said, if you're going to work with young people, you better be prepared for both. Parents, <coughs> children, parents seeing their children grow up and develop. Hopefully a source of increasing joy and blessing. I'm here to tell you, dear people, sin can destroy all of that. Where sin rules the unredeemed heart, there begins that display of obstinate rebellion, lying, deceit. Sin has the power to alienate children from their parents, brothers, from, brothers and sisters from each other. Think of all the tension, the conflict, the bitterness, the tears, the heartache that has been caused by sin. Sin is opposed to and will ultimately destroy human relationships. Sin can ruin and destroy the closest human relationship that exists on earth, that of husband and wife. Ephesians says, For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There is no closer human relationship on the earth than the one flesh relationship that exists between husband and wife. Sin has the power to destroy that. The sin of selfishness, the root of those hateful words, those heated arguments, selfishness over financial matters within the family. Sin is the root cause of those first adulterous thoughts and desires that will have ultimately their end in divorce. I would ask you a question this morning. Is it not evident that sin is opposed to all that is good in general? Fourth category, sin is the source of all other evils. And considering this heading, the first point that we want to establish is this. The real evil of all other so-called evils is the factor of sin. Think of the words that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. The sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin. What is true of death is true of all other evils and afflictions. Follow my thinking as I quote from Jeremiah Burroughs. The sting of a sickness, the sting of the loss of your estates, the sting of discredit, the sting of imprisonment, the sting of afflictions, and that which makes them bitter to the soul is sin. Think of that. Let me state it differently. It is sin that makes all adverse circumstances in the life to be bitter. That's the bitterness of it, as sin has a part in it. 
Talk, let's talk about the Apostle Paul. He was in prison. Of course, I do, I'm quite involved with the prison ministry, and I think of that. I wonder what that prison was like. Dark, filthy, smelly, no restroom facilities, no light, rats. Think of that. He suffered in prison, but Paul did not suffer the bitter pain of the guilt of sin. See the difference? Paul knew what it was to suffer bodily afflictions, but because he walked in communion with God, he could say, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulation works patience. What a glorious liberty. Suffering as he did. Physical ailments. Imprisonment. This is the language of a man who knew real suffering. But it was not the consequence of his own sin. It was due to his own obedience to the will of God. There's a difference. Jeremiah Burroughs says sin is, as it were, the rotten core in the apple. It will make all the fruit to be bitter and rotten. And so take away the rotten core, and you will not taste so much bitterness in the fruit. So if sin, the rotten core, is cut out, affliction will not be so bitter. He goes on to say the sting of a sickness, the sting of the loss of your state, the sting of discredit, the sting of imprisonment, the sting of afflictions, and that which makes them bitter to the soul is sin. There is much sickness directly related to sinful behavior. Those who are suffering all kinds of bodily pain, physical weakness, maybe even facing death. And in the back of their mind, they know that if they had avoided certain sins, they would not be in their present condition. Indeed, experience a bitterness which those who may be suffering the same pain and discomfort, but their sickness has no direct relation to a particular sin. Trust you're getting the picture. What about the loss of material possessions? There are those who have lost their homes, their estates, their property. Through no fault of their own. But there are those who have lost their estate because of sin. They've lost it. Everything, reputation, income, job, health. There are those who have had their name unjustly discredited. But think of the bitterness, listen carefully. Think of the bitterness that a man must experience when he has been guilty of some vile and scandalous sin that has ruined his life. There are those whose husbands or wives have left. But the husband or wife who knows that their mate left 
because of their own sinful behavior, their own sinful neglect to fulfill the biblical role of a husband or a wife, knows that a great deal of the weight of the guilt for that happening, it rests upon their shoulders. What about the parent whose child is arrested? And deep down that parent knows that he has been sinfully neglectful in loving and in disciplining that child. And now he's in the juvenile. I can tell you many such situations. I've dealt with young people whose parents were in jail most of their childhood life, in prison. And when they were not in prison, they were drunks. How sinful is sin? Charles Hodge puts it this way, the true character of sin as sin is revealed by its making even that which in itself good the very means of evil. Now I want to move to the next heading. This might be a little bit, little bit difficult to grasp. Because I don't mean it in an absolute sense. But let me say it this way very carefully. There is a kind of infiniteness in sin. I didn't say sin is infinite. Only God is infinite. But sin is against an infinite God. So how can you measure that sin, the evil of it? It's against a God who is infinite. And so I say, there is a kind of infiniteness in sin. How do we know that that's true? First of all, let me just say this, because it takes God Almighty to overcome it. That gives you a clue, doesn't it? as to the power and to the depth and the grip and the infiniteness of it, only God can overcome it. Burroughs said, take the least sin that any man or woman lies under the power of. What is it? What is that sin that any individual might be under the power of it? The truth is, nothing but the infinite power of God can overcome that sin. And this is the reason why men who have had many convictions of conscience of the evil of sin, many resolutions against sin, many vows and promises against it have failed. To no avail. We read in Romans 6, 14, sin shall not be master over you. Why? Because you made a promise, a vow, but because you're now under grace. The grace of God has the power. It can be said there is a kind of infinite, infiniteness in sin because it deserves punishment. But what kind of punishment? What kind of punishment does it take to satisfy the guilt of sin? Eternal punishment. Not just do 20 years in prison. 
that can't even be measured on the chart of eternity. That sin deserves not 20 years, it deserves eternal punishment. That tells you something of the infiniteness of sin. Revelation 20, 14, and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There's another reason why we say that there's a kind of infiniteness in sin. Because of what is required to make atonement. What's going to make atonement for sin? Gold, silver, religiosity. One thing, the blood of Christ. The shed blood of Christ. What does that tell you about sin? The penalty which Christ paid by shedding his blood was the exact penalty demanded by God's righteousness. Well, someone might ask, how could this be when Christ was not held forever by death and did not experience the remorse and despair of the second death? Good question. There is an answer. The answer is this. The dignity of Christ's person gives to his temporal sufferings a moral value equal to the weight of all the guilt of the elect. It took the suffering of the infinite Son of God to pay the full penalty of sin. And finally, we've already mentioned this. There is a kind of infiniteness in sin because it is against an infinite God. You see, if we sin against another human being, that human being is finite. It is far different when we sin against God. David acknowledged that his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah was actually against God. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. How could we even begin to measure the far-reaching effects of our sin against an infinitely holy God? Our next heading is this. The evil of sin is seen in its conformity with the devil. Sin is of the same nature as the devil. What does that mean? Let me put it this way. If Satan could, he would destroy God. So would sin. Sin, if it could be carried out to its nth degree, would annihilate God. Whatever that sin is. It might be just a lie. But if that lie could become full grown and full developed and continue on and on and on and have its full effect, if it could, it would destroy God. Satan purposes to destroy souls of men in hell. So does sin. Satan seeks to destroy all that is good. So does sin. Sin has its origin in the devil. 1 John 3, 8, For the devil has sinned from the beginning. John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Sin advances the kingdom of Satan. Ephesians 2. 
according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You're beginning to see why you might have a conflict with an unsaved co-worker. Satan is at work in them. The spirit of evil. And you walk in and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. There's a conflict. A mighty conflict. Some things to think about. The Lord's Prayer. We pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we not take the name of our God in vain when we pray that prayer and then by our sin oppose the kingdom of God? Favor the kingdom of Satan by our sin? Sin is a fulfilling of the will of Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26 And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Well, I want to close with these applications. There are many non-biblical views of sin. Men have gone to great lengths to explain away the existence of sin. And even in our day, when we're confronted with so much perversion, what's the excuse? I was born that way. Or we rename it. It's not this, it's this. It's not some genetic defect. Men are born sinners. In sin did my mother conceive me. Just as through one man sin entered the world. Isaiah 53, 6. All of us, without exception, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Sin is a moral evil for which we stand responsible to God. Well, may God use his word to keep us in line and that we might not be unduly influenced by the world in which we live. And sin itself is so deceiving that it can come up with an excuse of why it's okay in this situation. Or it's okay for you. Sin is deceiving and hardens the heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We pray that you will use it in each of our hearts and lives. We pray, Father, that we will take sin seriously and deal with it biblically. May we encourage one another day after day, while it is still called us today, lest any of us be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.